good morning, everyone. How nice to see you. On a dreary July, oblique August day, it seems as though they merge into one another nowadays. However, it's lovely to be with you this morning, and we're here to worship God, and we can do that joyfully together. I've not been given specific information on intimations. They are printed in the order of service, and those watching online can, I think, see them online, and you are equally welcome, if I may say so. I thought I would, however, just take the opportunity to thank a number of people who we sometimes forget to thank. I think particularly we should thank Murdo this morning for running our children's holiday club through the past week. A huge amount of effort both by Murdo and his helpers. I, I gather 40 children registered and 20 to 30 turned up uh, every day and a very happy time was had so we're very grateful to Murdo. When I look out I see mostly white hair just like my own but the point is we need the children that Murdo's looking <coughs> after so that these seats are filled when we are gone so we're grateful to Murdo. I think we should thank our choir and our organist for their faithful attendance Sunday by Sunday, the contribution they make to our worship. I think we should thank our Beatles, who are various and several, but faithful. I think we should thank the ladies who do the flowers and those who put them together again and deliver them to homes where there is need at the end of the service. I think we should thank the ladies and gentlemen who provide the tea and coffee up in the cars row after the service here. And of course the people that make the church work, keep it clean, keep it tidy, and keep it safe. All of this is going on behind our backs, week by week, they're quietly forgotten, they are faithful, faithful stewards. And we want to say thank you to you. So let us, as we come to worship, hear some words from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. So with joy in our hearts, we sing our first hymn together, and that is hymn 112, God, whose almighty word.
Now let us all join in prayer. Let us all pray. Our gracious, loving, and eternal God, we come together to worship you as the God of gods and Lord of lords, and as our Saviour. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we can scarcely comprehend why you would be interested in unimportant individuals like us. But Lord, we bless you that we are made in your image, that a loving relationship was, with you was always planned. And so we thank you, Lord, that when that relationship exists, we can live life in its fullest form. Lord, we bless you for the new creation that is offered as we commit to our faith in you. And Lord, we bless you that we have the promise of your presence here in this sanctuary. As we hear words spoken, scripture read, music sung, Lord, have the inner ear of our hearts open so that we may hear your still small voice just as Elijah did thousands of years ago in the cave. We're conscious, Lord, that we are blessed to be able to worship you in peace without restraint while thousands of our Christian fellow brothers and sisters across Europe and the world live in dread and in fear. So, Lord, help us never to take these things for granted, but to bless you for the freedom we enjoy. We ask, Lord, for those who cannot be with us today, who would love to be here, and individually we think of people known to us who need your special grace and blessing. So, Lord, be with us as we worship you, and hear us as we pray in the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. As I fulfill the role of a peripatetic preacher around the city, I'm familiar with the phenomenon of preparing a young person's talk and then standing the pulpit and looking out and seeing no young people. <laughs> uh, Margo, you faced that this morning, but you're going to adapt it for the young in heart. Thank you, Ken. Good morning. Um, you can tell the holiday club went well as all the kids are probably still asleep in their beds. Uh, today I wanted to finish our holiday club series in a sense. So last Sunday we started um, with uh, four main words. This is my son. This was uh, God declaring Jesus as his son at his baptism. And then throughout each of the days of the holiday club we had signs that guided us towards the story. The first day was follow, Jesus calling disciples to follow him. Second was listen and obey, him telling the story of the wise men. The wise man listened and obeyed, the foolish man didn't. And then we had the story of the winds and the waves obeying Jesus during the storm. And then on the fourth day we had the feeding of the 5,000, this amazing miracle that's told through all four Gospels. And then on Friday we had friendship, the story of Peter and his relationship with Jesus, starting off with his denial of Jesus, absolute low point and then going on to Jesus redeeming him and telling him to go feed his lambs, to go share the word of God. So today I want to think about the Great Commission, as we call it, the last part of Matthew. We were going through the book of Matthew for all of these stories. And as we get to the end of Matthew, we see Jesus talking to the disciples. 
and sending them out to do something. Now, has anyone ever been asked to do something that is completely out of your like realm of possibility, anything that's out of your pay grade at all? Anyone been asked to do something like that? A few people, yeah. Sometimes you get asked to do things that are absolutely wild. I think quite often we can forget the disciples were young people. The disciples were teenagers. The oldest one would have been Peter, who would have been maybe in his 20s, but they weren't that old. They weren't really prepared enough to go out. If you were to go up to a high school and say, right, I need all of you to go travel the world and tell people all about the gospel, all about Jesus, do you think they'd be able to do that by themselves without any guidance at all? You wouldn't. It's an unrealistic thing to ask. But the good thing that we see in the Bible is that we see Jesus saying, you're not going to be alone. On the Friday, we were talking about Jesus being like a light, him guiding them through the darkness, the murkiness of the world. And when Jesus dies and goes back to heaven, he says, you're not alone. I'm going to send the Spirit to come help you. And we see the disciples being patient. We see them waiting and holding off for a second till the Spirit comes so they can be guided before they go out and help and do this stuff. And when they get the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, we see this amazing joyfulness as they dash out of the upper room, as they dash out and start spreading the word, because they then have that guidance. And sometimes we can feel like we're a bit lost in faith. Sometimes we can think, how are we supposed to do this? How are we supposed to manage this? And when we're told, go out and tell people all about the word, sometimes we can think, well, how am I supposed to do that in my everyday life? How am I supposed to go and tell people about this in my context? And the answer to that is by being patient and having the Spirit guide you in what you need to do. So we're going to be singing a song, um, the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. And there are actions for this one that I will lead you in as well. Um, so um, we're going to have that song for us today. is going to read two rather lengthy uh, scripture readings this morning. I would ask you please to listen carefully, concentrate on what Pat is reading, and then imagine that you were going to preach a sermon based on something in one or other of these readings. I won't be asking questions what it would be, 
But please listen and concentrate because this is a core part of our worship, the public reading of God's inspired word. Thank you for that. First reading is from Second Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 17. So I made you up, I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote to you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused, has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, as those sent from God. And our second reading is from Galatians chapter 5, reading verses 13 to 26. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit, 
and you will not gratify the desires of sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the nat sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and destroying each other. Amen. Let us join together in singing hymn 542. Lord, speak to me that I may speak.
travel far to hear scripture read better than Pat read those passages for us so meaningfully. And you know, the hymn we've just sung, the first couple of lines are in a sense what happens to me every Monday morning when I know I'm preaching the following Sunday. This hymn starts with, Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of your tone. And that is roughly what I pray every time I'm trying to bear a sermon because you have heard me say before, I need a spark. I need something to inspire me so that I have something meaningful to say to all of you good folks. So I wonder what spark you might have got from the passages that have just been read. And you will have seen the title of the sermon in the order of service is Christian Fragrance. A slightly odd title, but then I am a slightly odd chap, so that's not a surprise. And I, I did struggle to find an appropriate title for this sermon. I really didn't think I could entitle it, What Do I Smell Like? I thought that, that might not go down terribly well. And that seemed a bit personal uh, with connotations of deodorant use. I didn't want recommendations at the door as I went, as you all went out. And yet, smells or aroma, as Pat read all in Corinthians, are very much part of our lives. So I settled on Christian fragrance. But this fragrance can't be bought in an expensive bottle or atomizer. Now, you know, you've heard me say it so many times, I'm the father of two daughters and three granddaughters, so there's very little I don't know about fragrances and their cost. And you may have heard the phrase, wake up and smell the coffee, uh, sometimes spoken to someone who's not too eager to get out of bed. And you can't fail to immediately bring to mind the smell of newly mown grass or bacon sizzling or an old-fashioned rose. I think ladies are much better at recognizing aromas or smells than we men. It always amazes me when a lady meets another lady and compliments her on the perfume they're wearing. And it happens quite commonly, I think you're nodding and agree. It's quite common for our granddaughters to find something like a scarf or a sweater in our home and say, oh, this smells just like grandma. Every so often when one of them's giving me a cuddle, they'll say, surprised, grandpa, you smell like grandma. <laughs> and please be clear, that's not because I was using a perfume. But it simply reflects the fact that we've been close to one another and fragrance Spreads. It can pass from one person to another or from one person into the space around them, often without the supplier actually being aware of it. We all have friends who keep telling us that they've stopped smoking, Alan, but, <laughs> but their fragrance tells a different story. Fragrance or aroma or as my old friend, the King James Version states, savor has always been a big part of religious life and religious ritual. And as early as the third book of the Old Testament, Moses lays out instructions on how burnt offerings are to be prepared. And in Leviticus chapter one, he says, then the priest shall burn the offering on the wood that is burning on the altar, it is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to God. Now, nowadays, outside of the Muslim tradition, there are very, very few burnt offerings being used to try to please God. But incense is widely used, and quite a lot of denominations use it both as a symbol of spreading the presence of the Holy Spirit and to create an aroma hopefully pleasing to God. So given that context, today I want to challenge us all, myself included, with another question. What aroma does my life give off? 
what aroma does my life give off? And I'm going to dare to read again the verses Pat read, not all of them you'll be glad to hear, but from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, just these verses. Thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. Uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. We are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ. Now, I see this as a colossal responsibility, and so did the Apostle Paul, as we'll read later. In the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, we read, When they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that they had been with Jesus. The aroma of Christ was obvious in the life and attitude of his two followers. It was said of the early church in a tone of astonishment See how these Christians love one another. The early Christians gave off a rare fragrance. That fragrance is called love. Now the world has lived through two centuries or more since those heady days, but in preparing this I've been forced to ask myself, what fragrance characterizes the Christians of today? If you asked a non-believer about the core characteristic of the Christian church and modern day Christians, I wonder what they would say. Many things, I suspect. Sadly, I doubt whether they would immediately say, well, they certainly love one another. I'm fearful that they would be more likely to raise their eyebrows and say, well, they certainly love themselves. And there's a world of difference between those two responses. I wonder which is more accurate. What is our image? As we briefly explore this thought, can I throw in the idea that the way our friends think of the church depends on what they think of you and me. To the non-believer, we are the aroma of Christ. In modern parlance, the vibes we give off are likely to be the single biggest influence on their attitude. And Paul describes this in verses 15 that I've just read. The last phrase is fascinating. Who is equal to such a task? Who can live this way? How is that humanly possible? How in the world can I live in such a way that I exude the aroma of Christ? More of that a little later. Like all Presbyterian churches, we are part of a so-called cluster to determine how to share our limited resources and reduce the number of church buildings, all of which we cannot afford to maintain. And solving this huge problem requires literally the wisdom of Solomon. And with Sheila and Jade, I'm involved in these discussions, and it's fascinating to hear fellow Christians speaking frankly about their priorities. Presbytery is using mission as the linchpin which will drive the changes. And nothing short of the local and national image of our church is at stake. So what do the people in our local community and village think of our local church? Are they struck by our unity of purpose or shocked 
by our infighting? What has happened to the one Lord, one faith, one baptism spoken of in Ephesians 4, and dare I add, one church? It's often said that the Church of Scotland, unlike the political parties, is a broad church. And the discussions we've been part of have certainly shown that to be true. The more evangelical or fundamentalist wing of the church find it difficult to contemplate any form of union with their fellow Christians who are of a more so-called liberal persuasion. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, is this really the reality? And how has it happened that in so many small Scottish towns and major streets in our cities, you might easily find two or three churches of Scotland within a few hundred yards of one another. I had a dental appointment just last Thursday, parked my car, came out into the adjacent bigger street. There were three colossal sanctuaries with massive turrets, or whatever you call them, uh, spires, I think you call them, uh, in the street, within a hundred yards of one another, and a fourth one just over the trees not far. Four churches within, I don't know, half a square mile. Astonishing. And how has that happened? Well, it's usually happened because fellow Christians have fallen out over relatively peripheral matters of doctrine or a very precise interpretation of particular verses of Scripture. Time doesn't allow the development of that issue, but to return to the theme what does the presence of several different churches, apparently of the same denomination, do for the fragrance of the gospel? We are trying to bring them together, and we're finding that everyone welcomes this inevitable change as long as their church is not involved. As I said earlier, we need Solomon to be reincarnated. In closing, let me refer to the second reading that Pat gave us in the book of Galatians, which I believe holds the key to solving our problem. How can we live lives that properly reflect the values of God's kingdom? The answer lies in allowing the Holy Spirit of God to so invade our lives, our thinking and our actions, that we inevitably spread his aroma. It's not an act of volition, it's the inevitable consequence of commitment. And I'm going to read again just a few verses from Galatians to illustrate the point. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus express these fruits of the Spirit, as they are called. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. But these fruits of the Spirit will only come when the tree of life is planted within us. Now, Christian theologians and authorities talk in vague terms and all sorts of phrases about this relationship with Christ. They talk about Christ being for me. They talk about Christ being with me. We often talk about Christ being ahead of us. But 1 Colossians chapter 1 uses a different phrase. And forgive me for again referring to Scripture. This is the authority of what I'm saying, not me. This is the authority. So Colossians 1 and verses 26 and 27. This mystery, how in the world can we live like this? This mystery 
has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. What's the mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ for you, not Christ with you, not Christ ahead of you, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. When we invite Jesus into our lives, he does just that. He comes in. And his fragrance can only be sensed outside when it dwells inside. That's what makes us real. The old Coca-Cola advert, it's the real thing. Well, if you want to sense the real thing of Christianity, Christ needs to be in our lives. And Paul asks in the question, in the passage we read, who is equal to the task of living this way? And the answer, of course, is none of us. But the way it happens is the infusion of God's grace into our lives. I think we need to stop looking at the ways others have gone wrong. We need to stop criticizing the way other Christians live their lives. We need to look at our own lives. I certainly need to look at my life. We need to allow God's Holy Spirit to energize our thinking and our living. Only then will those we meet take note of us as they did of Peter and John and say, they have been with Jesus. Amen. Now we'll continue with our worship and the offering will be brought forward as we rise and sing together. this morning, but we once again offer you our lives. Use them, change them, develop them, give us the spirit of Christ and his fragrance. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you for the infinite number of ways you show your love for us. 
thank you today, Lord, for all the work carried out in your name by those leading and taking part in the holiday club last week. We pray for all the children who attended, and we ask that you will follow with your blessing that the children and leaders may know your love for them and your presence in their lives. Dear God, you are the God of peace. You call us to be at peace with those around us, to love our enemies, and to pray for those who persecute. Today we ask once again for you to bring peace to Ukraine and to all countries where there is fighting and unrest. Inspire leaders of the world governments to choose peace instead of violence and to seek reconciliation and give us hope for a future of peace based on justice for all. <clears throat> Lord, we pray for our own country at this time of change and uncertainty, which makes us anxious about the future. We give thanks that you never tire in your love and care for us, and especially not when times are hard and painful. Loving Father, make us worthy of your love. Hear these our prayers. And all the unspoken prayers of our hearts, which we bring to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I thank you so much for that <coughs> sensitive and delightful prayer. Now I know I talk about my family all the time, so I'll not disappoint you and I'll talk about them again. Um, a few weeks ago we were way down south at the uh, baptism of two of our three little granddaughters, and to my surprise, the, I was sharing the service a wee bit, and on, on the way out, the organ said, so what hymn would you like me to play as we go out? What is your favorite hymn? And I don't know if you've ever been asked that, when you're put on the spot like that, it's quite tricky. Well, the hymn I came up with is the hymn we're, of, hymn we're about to sing. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. We'll sing it together. Thank you.
now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Saviour be glory and majesty, dominion and power now and forevermore. Amen.